Good evening. Good evening and welcome to Scheller College of Business at Georgia Tech and the fourth presentation of the Digital Disruption Speaker Series. Uh, we are delighted that you could join us this evening and uh, I'm Maryam Alavi, Dean of the College of Business. Uh, our Digital Disruption Speaker Series uh, explore ways uh, where organizations and managers uh, successfully harness advanced information technology to accelerate innovation, create value, and build the workforce of the future. So just to give you a little bit of uh, background about our speaker series, uh, Scheller College of Business and the Accenture uh, have partnered in this uh, speaker series. And uh, as you may know, Scheller College uh, is an innovative and top business school that operates and positions itself at the intersection of business and technology. And Accenture is a world leader in working with organizations across industries to leverage digital technologies to help them grow and to compete in the digital era. I cannot think of any other two organizations that are better positioned to come together to address this very important topic. Uh, computer systems uh, are increasingly uh, displaying intelligent uh, behavior. Uh, examples include uh, speech recognition, translation from one sp spoken language to another, uh, self-driving cars and, uh, of course, uh, computer vision, recognizing objects and people. Uh, intelligent computer behavior is powered by a set of tools and techniques collectively referred to as machine learning or more generally as AI, artificial intelligence. Tonight's the panel will focus on how artificial intelligence is influencing and changing the way we do business. Uh, AI has moved from labs into mainstream, gaining traction through personalization and prediction. Our panel discussion will explore how AI is impacting and continues to create challenges and opportunities uh, for businesses. Uh, I, would not, I would now like to welcome our panelists, um, esteemed uh, panel members for tonight. You have seen their very impressive bios uh, in the program announcements, and uh, I'm not going to repeat uh, their many awesome accomplishments, uh, but I will take just a few minutes, a few seconds, I should say, to introduce them uh, and their organizational uh, affiliation. In alphabetical order, um, I will introduce them, and I'm going to ask the audience to hold your applause until I have invited all the panelists to the stage, and then we will give them a great Georgia Tech and Scheller College welcome. Uh, the first panelist is Joe Deppa. Joe is the Managing Director, AI Lead at Accenture Digital. Uh, please join us on the stage, Joe. Uh, the next panelist is Valentine Val Fontama. He is the Global Practice Lead of AI at Google Professional Services. And uh, he has flown all the way from Seattle, Washington to be here tonight. So thank you for taking the time to do that. Uh, and then I have Charles Isbell. Uh, Charles is Executive Associate Dean and Professor at College of Computing at Georgia Tech. And as of July 1, formally stepping into the role of Dean at College of Computing. So welcome and let's welcome our great panelists. Well, thank you again. Uh, I will ask a number of questions from our panelists. You'll notice that some questions are the same question from everybody, and in some cases, I'll ask different questions from different panelists. And uh, then we'll open it to the audience for your questions. So, uh, Joe, let me start with you okay. and ask you to please uh, give us a little overview of your role uh, at Accenture. Of course, Accenture has their innovation lab um, and the Center for Intelligent Analytics across the street, literally from Scheller College. So give us an overview. Sure. So, so I lead our Southeast Applied Intelligence practice. 
and we're focused on bringing AI solutions to our clients and helping our clients become more data driven. So we have about 100 data scientists, machine learning experts, and what we call AI strategists in our group. And Val, my friend here from Google, was telling me we need more Google machine learning experts. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's on our list. Um, and in terms of the Innovation Hub, it's a, it's a very cool space. Obviously, I had a much shorter com commute than Val across the street. That's right. And um, the idea is that in today's times, right, there's a, it's a, as you mentioned, there's a massive disruption taking place. And our clients are trying to figure out how do you co-create, how do you innovate at scale more mm. quickly. So the, the goal is that we bring our clients to the innovation hub across the street. We bring folks like Scheller and, and professors from Scheller to the innovation hub. And we also have our, our team of data scientists there. And we just go and attack whatever problem they may have together. And so that's the goal of the innovation hub. And we're seeing some nice success out of it. That's great. Val, tell us about uh, the AI global practice at Google and your specific role. OK, thank you. First of all, thank you very much, Dean, for having me here today. Sure. It's a special honor. It's my first time at Georgia Tech. All right. Um, we have the privilege in Google Professional Services to work with our customers, enterprise customers, literally all around the world to help them transform their businesses with AI. Uh, I can't tell you how much of a privilege it is for me to actually uh, advise uh, executives at all levels, including several CEOs, um, really helping them to reshape and reposition their businesses with AI. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's no surprise that um, AI offers tremendous opportunity. We're actually in the, in the middle of um, what they call the fourth uh, industrial revolution, uh, powered by technologies like AI, IoT, uh, robotics, etc. And <coughs> it's incredible to see how much interest there is in um, this wave. A lot of um, CEOs and their direct uh, reports see the opportunities, but they really need help, many of them, to find a good place for AI. How do we actually use these AI technologies to transform our businesses for the future? That's great. Charles, uh, tell us about all the wonderful things that go on at College of Computing and uh, your specific uh, role in there, your current and perhaps the forthcoming role. Mm. So first off, uh, thank you for having me as well. Sure. This is not my first time at Georgia Tech, mm -hmm. but I, uh, <laughs> I have spent many, many, he many also, years here. Yeah, he also got his degrees from Georgia Tech, so he has been <laughs> here for a while, yeah. I've been here for a very, very, very long time, uh, off and on. And uh, so I guess there's kind of three answers to your question. So first off, uh, the College of Computing, I think it's worth knowing, is uh, one of the largest colleges of computing in the country. It is only the second one to have been created in the world. Uh, only a year after CMU, which was uh, uh, the first. Uh, and what's really nice about computing, and I think what really matters here for uh, discussions around AI and machine learning, is that uh, it is broad. So it brings together the people who build the devices on the one hand, all the way to the lawyers, the psychologists, um, the people who worry about humans and how humans interact with computing systems and, and everywhere in between. So I play two roles. I'm the executive associate dean, uh, as Marion pointed out. And you can think of me as the COO for the college. So I sort of oversee the uh, academic business operations and do a little bit of work on the business operations. Um, but I'm also a professor and I spend all of my time working on machine learning. In fact, I teach the machine learning class here. There are 348 students in this room between 1.30 and 2.45 earlier today before a bunch of people showed up and put a screen and moved a bunch of stuff out of the way. Uh, and it was the last class that I was, I was teaching for the semester. I do machine learning and I work specifically in the problem of understanding how human beings are modeled by machines and how human beings are influenced by machine learning algorithms into doing the things that we secretly want them to do. Okay. Uh, Joe, Accenture has identified machine learning and analytics as uh, one of the key drivers for restoring and increasing the profitability of uh, b various businesses. Could you give us a couple examples of cases that you may be familiar uh, that this has actually taken place? Yes. You in the terms of machine learning and AI, I think one of the, the, the key components is that our clients are all in very different places, right? So we often think of AI and machine learning as, in my, in my view, it's, it's like a puzzle, right? It's a giant puzzle piece. And the idea is that some clients are just now opening the puzzle and they're kind of throwing the pieces all over the floor. Other clients are still just sort of admiring the puzzle 
in the, in the box before they actually want to do anything with it. And there's others, like some of our digital native companies here, who are well along the journey. And they've already started the puzzle, they may have finished the puzzle, and they're doing the next one, right? And the pieces of the puzzle are all the things that we're going to talk about tonight. It's the people, it's the process, it's the technology, it's the data, it's the ethics, right? Those are the components that go into some of the machine learning and AI uh, components that we're helping our clients with. In terms of examples, I'll give three, three quick examples. One's, one's a little bit more humorous. One of my buddies actually um, texted me yesterday that uh, McDonald's is actually using visual recognition to, to actually do quality control on Egg McMuffin sandwiches. So I didn't know that was a big deal, but Egg McMuffin sandwiches, <laughs> I guess the size of the bun is a really big deal for quality control. Next so, time you'll have one of those. Th you're going to think about this. it next time. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of a funny, it's a funny example, but it is something that starts to show how, how visual recognition is actually being used within, within uh, companies today. And you, you, you can imagine the society with better Egg McMuffin sandwiches, right? <laughs> um, in terms of what I'm working on, one of the, one of the more interesting projects is we're helping a, a telecommunications client actually in their call center. They've struggled with having bad customer service. I don't know if anybody's ever called one of the call centers here. If you've got a phone, I hear a phone going off there. Um, but it's usually a, a bad customer experience. And so they're leveraging AI to actually improve the customer experience. It reduces cost, but it also, what we found in the last two to three years, is that the customer experience of the, the actual bots is outperforming the human agents by a large margin. So that's a, a pretty interesting example where you're starting to see AI and machine learning actually be outperforming a human. And the last example I'll give is there, what I'm most passionate about is something that we're seeing in medicine and healthcare. And it, when, when it comes to AI, AI has done phenomenal um, in terms of helping progress precision medicine. And many of the folks that know me and are here tonight know that that's a, a passion of mine because not only can we actually diagnose more effectively, there's new, there's new ways to diagnose, for example, melanoma with AI machine learning algorithms with about a 95% confidence interval versus um, regular dermatologists at about an 87% confidence interval. And what's interesting about that is you can actually, when you combine the two and you leverage the machine learning and the AI with the dermatologist, it's 99.5%. So you can imagine the, the potential with AI when it comes to precision medicine and healthcare. That's great. Uh, well, sort of a similar question. Uh, which industries seem to be benefiting the most from AI applications? And uh, you mentioned as uh, there's such a uh, enthusiasm about uh, using machine learning in various industries. Which ones are the ones that can benefit the most? And if you could give us a couple examples, would be great. Okay, sure. So we, we do work with customers literally from uh, many different industries. But I think it's fair to say, Dean, that uh, some industries will benefit more from AI than others, right? <clears throat> so some of the top industries that stand to benefit the most include things like retail, uh, healthcare, financial services and banking, automation, uh, transport and logistics, travel, for instance. Those, com those industries um, are, more, have, are more amenable right. to uh, AI and have more opportunities. Uh, I want to talk about three very uh, quick examples of customers and partners we work with to really transform their businesses with AI. First one is eBay. We all know eBay. One of their popular features is uh, product search. And um, even before we, we worked with uh, eBay, yeah, product search technology used ML for image recognition. Mm. But it took too long to train. It took literally months to train uh, these models. Why? Because uh, first, they don't have enough compute power on premises, and second, um, you know, the, you need over 50, you need to train this, these models, one of them with over 51 million images. It just takes a lot of um, compute horsepower. So we partnered with eBay and basically rebuilt their image recognition models on the cloud, on, on Google Cloud Platform. And as a result, they saw a 10 X improvement in the speed of training with a 10% increase in accuracy. And the improvement in, um, in speed comes from a dedicated hardware called Cloud TPU. TPU stands for Tensor Processing Unit. This is a dedicated uh, processor designed and, and built by Google engineers specifically to accelerate AI workloads. 
Second um, customer is Rolls-Royce, one of my favorites as well. Because with Rolls-Royce, we're going from autonomous cars to autonomous ships. I kid you not. Um, Rolls-Royce uh, Marine Division has this vision of building the next generation of autonomous container, sh uh, container ships to reduce operational cost and improve efficiency. But to achieve this, you have to have intelligence built in on every vessel. Mm. And a critical part of intelligence you need is uh, vision. So we worked with them to build um, image recognition models uh, for uh, their onboard vessels. And this is all built on Google Cloud again, using um, deep learning technology in TensorFlow. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's critical because as a, the, um, the vessel navigates at sea, it's supposed to quickly identify uh, image, uh, objects around it, right? Mm -hmm. If it sees an object, um, what op what's that object? Is it a, another container ship? Is it a sailboat? Or is it war betides? Is it uh, an iceberg? Mm -hmm. right? And if it's a moving object, is it moving towards us or away from us? Mm -hmm. You have to have intelligence on board to help you make the right decisions because the wrong decisions could be extremely costly. Um, so uh, ML engineers and consultants from Google Professional Services worked with Rolls-Royce on the first of many uh, of these um, AI models. Last one, uh, and another really close fav uh, favorite, is a healthcare partner. Uh, it's called Moorfields Eye Hospital in London. It's, it's uh, Moorfields, for those of you familiar with the UK, it's one of the leading eye hospitals in the UK. And they partnered um, a few years ago with Google's DeepMind in London to see if they can improve the way you diagnose um, some of the leading factors of blindness, right? The, it turns out there's some pretty common diseases like glaucoma or diabetic retinopathy that actually cause blindness for over 285 patients around the world. But the sad part is, in many cases, this blindness is preventable. If you detect the disease early, it is taught, many of them are totally treatable. Um, the good news is only last month, uh, DeepMind and the hospital actually announced stunning results. They showed that um, they can achieve two things with this new AI technology. Number one, they can accurately detect any one of these leading causes of blindness and prioritize it accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, so the AI solution detected it at 95% accuracy, which is on par with the highly trained ophthalmologist, right? You only get that kind of performance from uh, an ophthalmologist with 20 years of experience, so that's stunning. The second thing which blew my mind is just the speed of processing. Mm -hmm. We humans are not that great at processing um, um, so many images at the same time, and even an, a human expert needs time to carefully process each image. Well, uh, DeepMind actually did a live study on a real patient that, um, you know, they, they used this, this AI model to diagnose the disease in 30 seconds right there. That's remarkable. Thank you. Great examples. Uh, Charles, let's look at our own industry of higher education. How do you think machine learning can impact or transform or enhance our own industry? So uh, it's an interesting question. I, I think it touches on two different ways in which uh, higher ed is going to be affected by, by AI. And one of them is actually, I think, connected to both of the, uh, two sets of examples you've heard before. Uh, one of the things that I think went by relatively quickly there is that uh, in, in both of the cases where, where you mentioned, um, mentioned health, was that it's not that the machine was better than the human. Sometimes that is true, or just as good as a human. Um, and it's not that the human was better or worse than the machine. It's that when you put the two of them together, you actually get better results than you could from either. So you might get 95% from the human, you might get 93% or 96% from the machine, but when you put them together, you can get near 100%. Because it turns out they're complementary and they work together. And we see this happening again and again and again. And in fact, we can even show that for, uh, there's lots of results that are out there that show this, but you can even take non-experts who know nothing about any of whatever those words that you just said, and they can actually <laughs> make the machine better. You can take someone who's never heard of chess and they can make the chess um, algorithm better because they know something about the structure of games in general. Right? And you see this in medicine, you see this in, in, over and over again. And that touches on us in the universities in two completely different ways. 
One is a place like Georgia Tech, of course, is a large research university. We do research. So the way AI, the way computing, the way data science, the way all of these things are affecting us inside the university is it's affecting the way we do the research that we do. So you will not be able to get a degree in history in 10 years without knowing computing, without knowing AI, without knowing data science. Because it turns out that the stuff that people do in history involves looking at tons and tons and tons of data, of text. No human being is ever going to be able to look at it in a lifetime. And using machines that can do natural language processing, that can study images and detect relationships between things, can find things for human beings to discover that are interesting about history. We've had huge um, advances in our understanding of the founding of democracy in Greece, for example, based on people's ability to use data to detect migration patterns across the ancient world that got us to, got us to democracy in Greece for example. And that's on the research side. But on the other side, if you think about what universities do, or at least what most of the students in universities think they're supposed to do, is we teach students. Right? We, want to scale, we want to scale the way that we teach students. We want to give them feedback immediately. We want to uh, tailor their experiences to whatever it is they need to learn at the moment and over the, their lifetime as students. That is not going to happen by faculty such as myself alone, because I've got 348 seats in this room. I can't touch all 348 students on any given day or any given week or any given month. But I can build systems that adapt to the students, give me the information I need to understand what they're learning and what they're not learning, and to give the individual students the ability to do this and give them agency over the way that they learn. So I think what we're going to see over the next decade, less than the next decade, is a transformation of higher ed both as a place that teaches others what they need in order to perform as they go out in the world and teaches us how we can educate students more efficiently, more effectively, and reach more students more quickly. That sounds great. And again, uh, as someone in higher ed, I think the potential for using technology in development and learning is tremendous because there are certain things that people develop through coaching and mentoring. You need person-to-person -person relationships and there are certain things that people can do in terms of learning that is just being in connect, contact with information. So I think eventually what I would like to see in terms of the way we go about educating people is that we delegate to machines things that can be done effectively and efficiently by machines. So as educators, we can spend our time on developing higher order thinking and problem solving skills, uh, which require a fair amount of coaching and mentoring and hands-on experimentation on part of the student. So uh, I think those are exciting opportunities. So Joe, in your opinion, what is the most important thing for companies to be able to do, to get right, to be able to take advantage of machine learning? Well, the first thing we're telling companies is just get started, right? Mm -hmm. Don't be scared, just get started. Once we get past that, the, what we found is we, have, we actually did a survey of about 300 executives across Fortune 500 companies. And we asked that question. What has been the reasons for successful AI deployment? And interestingly enough, what you would expect were the top two or three were things like focusing on the customer experience first, focusing on leveraging partners instead of building things from scratch. Yay, right? Of course. Um, and, but the number one, the number one, and this is an interesting, this is an interesting part of the study. The number one, 92% uh, of the people that had done ethics training said that that was the reason that the AI pilot was successful. Ethics mm. training. So I actually asked some of those clients, hey. What do you mean? What do you <laughs> right. mean? Right, and what we found is that before they implemented a solution, what they did is they went out and they talked about it with their employees. They talked about what it meant, what it meant for their jobs, how it was going to help, to your point, how it was going to help them do things they'd rather be doing than the repetitive tasks, et cetera. And as a result, when the solution was actually implemented, they were <coughs> excited by it and not scared by it. And so that was the number one reason that, people, that companies re responded as having a successful AI deployment, ethics training. So that's something that Accenture, we're very passionate about, something called responsible AI and including ethics training and ethics components to look at things like data bias and look at things like the moral implications on society for some of these AI solutions. Okay, well that will, I'm hoping that we'll get to into more yeah. depth into that a little later, but uh, you know, technology changes a lot faster than people and organizations do, so I can see why this idea of unfreezing and preparing an organization for change is extremely important. Uh, so Val, uh, in some cases, uh, business decision makers need to un kind of explain their decision making and the rationale behind their decisions. And in some cases, AI is not 
doesn't lend itself for that kind of open explanation of why we came to a particular solution or decision. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Now, that's a great question because um, the, the, the truth is most ML algorithms and AI algorithms were never designed to be explainable, uh, right? That was not a, a key design goal. Yeah. If I go back to, you know, even 20 years ago when I was a, a graduate student, the goal was... At age five. Uh, <laughs> I don't mind dating myself. <laughs> the real goal was to build the most powerful um, predictive model, right? right. Um, but times have changed because, to your point, as AI and machine learning become more mainstream, we run into a real requirement from uh, many business users to explain the answers. It's not just good enough to be 100% accurate, even if the model uh, is. And we see this um, most concretely from regulate, highly regulated industries like financial services, healthcare, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, you will never get an AI anything through a regulator if you can't explain the answers. Um, the good news, though, is that, number one, this is an area of active academic research. Um, so there are several teams, research teams across the world, um, building new techniques to explain these black box models. Um, so two of them actually came from Seattle. Um, you know, Dr. Carlos Gershwin and his team um, developed two techniques called Lime and Anchor to explain black box models. Uh, I've actually used Lime in, um, in my previous life to explain churn models. Even churn models were built with deep learning and they do a very good job. But it doesn't end there. We have um, active research from Cornell University published um, a new approach called integrated gradients uh, that does the same thing using a different approach. We have a Shapley. So put together, the academic community is starting to um, release new techniques and approaches to help businesses explain their models. You know, uh, it's incidentally, the hospital ex um, example I shared earlier would not have worked without explanation. In fact, that's something uh, both the researchers at DeepMind and uh, Moorfield Eye Hospital called out explicitly. They said it was ab absolutely critical to, for the model to explain its predictions. Mm -hmm. Without that, the ophthalmolo uh, ophthalmologist would never bite the answers, and definitely the regulators wouldn't. So um, it, was big, it was built in you know, from the very beginning as a key business requirement that, number one, we have to build the most predictive model, but number two, we have to be able to explain the results. And because of the, the good performance and the explanation, this um, solution has been submitted to the UK healthcare or, uh, regulator uh, for approval. Very good. Charles, do you have any comments about the same uh, issue or question? How do we go about uh, this uh, issue of explaining models and performance? Uh? Yeah, also, so uh, quickly, oh, by the way, Car Carlos does fantastic work, so you should, <laughs> Thank you. you should keep working with him. I would say that um, th there's something there. So we're using words like models, um, but I think you really have to understand something. So anybody who take a programming class ever in their lives or anything like that? Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. I'm sorry. So here's the way it works with, with programming, right? When you're a computationalist and you think about algorithms, the question is always about, well, why does this algorithm do what it does, right? How do I sort numbers and how do I know that when I'm done, I'm going to have from lowest to highest? Or how do I know that I found uh, the maximum number, or the minimum number, or whatever it is that you're trying to do? And you talk about that in terms of steps that you take. That's what an algorithm is. And that's how we thought about it historically. The difference between machine learning AI and traditional computation is that the algorithm in some sense doesn't matter hardly at all. They're all equivalent from 800,000 square feet and you know, they're engineering questions. But in the end, they're all going to try to do some kind of prediction and you can prove how they will work on some form or another. The difference, and what really matters here, I think, for explainability, is that what's actually driving your performance and your outcomes at the end is not the algorithm so much as it is the data that you are feeding the algorithm. 
And so what we have to teach our own students, and we have to teach people who are going to be using these systems, is that the algorithm matters. You can use deep learning. I mean, deep learning's been around in one form or another for 30 or 40 years. We just finally had the computational power to be able to take advantage of it. You can use whatever you want, but it's the data that you feed into it that tells you whether how it's going to perform and why it is performing the way that it is performing, which brings us back to questions of ethics. It brings us back to questions of performance. So in computer science, we, we have this thing we talk about, GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. Put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. And in machine learning and in AI, particularly that that's driven by data, everything is garbage in and garbage out. And your explanation fundamentally has to be about the data that you are using to train. I'll, I'll just uh, I'll close on, on one thing. Something else that I think everyone up here has said in one form or another that it's, it's worth surfacing is none of this works unless you are doing it from the beginning. If you start out with, I'm going to solve this problem, and then I'll, I'll, I'll take the ethics black box and I'll tie it or I'm going to do this, and then I'll take the explanation box and I'll, I'll plug it in. It will not work. It will not be ethical. Uh, it will not perform well, and it will not be explainable. It must be built in and integrated from the very beginning. So, sort of the same thing when you talk about cybersecurity. You yes. cannot bolt it on at the end of the system. It needs to be designed into your system. Uh, Joe, how do you think AI and machine learning is uh, changing work, and what is Accenture doing to prepare the workforce of the future? So, so first off, we don't believe that there's going to be a jobs Armageddon and all the jobs are going away, right? Accenture Good to does, know. <laughs> yes, Accenture does not believe that. Um, but we do believe the jobs are going to change. The jobs of the future are going to be very different than what they are today. A large percentage of jobs are going to shift. And so what we talk about in, at Accenture is you've got the, the humans and you've got the machines, right? We know the humans can do more of the EQ-related tasks, as mm -hmm. you mentioned. We know the machines can do more of the automated tasks. So what, what's left is that what we call, what we're calling the missing middle. The missing middle are the new jobs that are coming out at many of these companies. And we, we break them down into three categories. There's the explainer. We've heard a lot about that already today. The explainer, how do you translate the data in, into what the actual business insight is going to be? Mm -hmm. right? That's a really, really important skill set that Accenture is trying to build and many of our clients are trying to build. The second one is the trainer. So think of the trainer as the person that's actually training the algorithms to produce the results that you want to have. You want to have. Now the trainer is also looking at the data, and 80 or 5, 80 or 90 percent of what they're trying to do is to fix the data. The last thing is the sustainer. So the sustainer, in our in our view, is kind of keeping the lights on. So they've got the the licenses in place. They've got the right data quality mechanisms in place. There's probably some exception processes when the AI fails. Right. That's the sustainer. And so those three roles are, are the roles that we think are, are critically important, not only for Accenture, but for our clients. Sounds good. Uh, Val, do you see growth in platforms or software tools that are going to facilitate creation of machine learning applications? I'm talking about things like Data Robot, Rapid Miner, and of course, uh, Google's AutoML. Uh, and do you think that's going to alleviate some of the, what we are observing in terms of shortage of engineers and data scientists? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I think it's necessary because we're in a, a situation where demand for AI and machine learning far, supply, uh, far exceeds supply, right? Mm. Uh, there's something like 2 million machine learning experts around the world and only about 10,000 deep learning researchers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, and in they're contrast, all employed by Google. No. Uh, I wish they were. <laughs> no, no. Uh, there's so much uh, right here in Georgia Tech, so yes, much right. and the rest are at, at Accenture. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, on the other hand, you have something like 23 million, 23 million developers around the world. And then for business analysts, it's even more. You have over 100 million uh, business analysts. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's a, one encouraging trend we have is for continuous learning. You know, universities like uh, Georgia Tech are busy uh, training the next generation of machine learning experts, but I don't think that's enough. Mm -hmm. We also ha have to address the tooling. And that's right. why I think your question um, is absolutely necessary. In my view, it's uh, inevitable uh, because we will not reach these millions of developers and business analysts otherwise. Right. Uh, you've seen tools like uh, Data Robot in the market for the last few years, um, but AutoML from Google um, is also really um, transforming the tooling and the product side, right? Because you have to drop the barrier to entry, right. 
right, to get more users to use AI, right? Uh, I'll have to <laughs> admit, I, um, I was a deep skeptic of this idea for many years, right? Because I'm sure, Charles, you also, you've also heard this vision. Well, we've had this vision in the industry for a long time, but hey, you know, who needs to hire, why, why hire an expensive PhD in uh, statistics or machine learning when you can use our product, right? There have been many s startups who went after this vision, but many of them actually failed. Um, the good news is today we're at a point where these products actually work, right? Um, I have never used Data Robot. I can't say anything about their product, but it's the, the very fact that they do have paying customers is a testament that um, there's some value in their product. Um, for AutoML, the work is not a fad. It didn't just come out of nowhere. It's actually based on original research from Google Brain over many years. Um, in fact, just last week, Kaggle uh, arranged, um, they organized a big contest in uh, San Francisco mm. with over 200 really smart data scientists from around the world to solve a specific predictive problem, right? So it's a typical Kaggle contest, but this one was done in a day. Long story short, AutoML came out second. In fact, AutoML was um, first for most of the day. It's only at the last minute that it was beaten out by, um, by one of the, the data science teams. So that's very encouraging because it really shows the power of this automation um, that will help us to reduce the barriers to entry, really helping uh, business users and uh, developers to take ad advantage of uh, AI. Great. And Charles, your thoughts on that, uh, some of these tools? So, I, I, so I, I like what you said at the end, which is that uh, you should hire more of my students. You should do that. The, um, <laughs> and that too. In fact, uh, I think this is right. Yeah. Four of my last seven PhD students work for Google. Wow. And it would be five, but... How many more do you have, Charles? I have, as, I have as many as we you need. We want all of them. As many as you need. I think, so, so from my point of view, the, the, the tools are mostly built by industry because industry has a reason for making those tools work. And in academia, we're sort of less interested in that part of it, not because it's not interesting, but our strengths are, are sitting over here and building the, the engines that are behind the tools. Sure. I mean, as, as you point out, uh, it was many, many, many years, decade of research by people who spend all their time thinking about this to get to a point where the tools itself, the tools themselves were, were actually useful. And that kind of division of labor uh, sort of matters quite a bit. Mm -hmm. In fact, mm -hmm. I would claim that the biggest barrier to the proper adoption and development of not just AI and machine learning, but the ability of people to use it correctly, is that Google is hiring every single person who's graduating uh, with a PhD mm -hmm. in um, mm -hmm. machine learning, um, which you should, not the other people's students. My students you should continue to do that with, but in general, you're hiring everyone and they're not going into academia. So that's a different answer to the question you have, but I will just share some data with you. In the last five years, the percentage of PhDs in computer science who've gone into academia has dropped by a third. Mm. Wow. And it's, it's entirely one company's fault, more or less. <laughs> and and that's, that's fine for them when they bring up truckloads of money and say, please come to be with us as opposed to someplace else. But it does mean that eventually we eat our own seed corn. So I think the big question underlying a lot of this sort of development is, how do we do that balance? How do we figure out how we can have partnerships between industry and academia so that we can build the tools and build the underlying technology that allow the tools to go, that allow people to have you know, to fulfill what, what they're trying to fulfill and to, to move everyone forward. Because otherwise, we're going to wake up um, half an academic generation from now, and there's not going to be anyone to teach and to train the next set of people, and then we're going to fall off a cliff. Actually, that's a very good and important point. Uh, but one of the things that Google is doing, they are, in addition just to coming and hiring the graduates, uh, they have developed new forms of partnerships with academic institutions mm -hmm. that tries to address some of that issues in terms of rotations and the way they go about these partnerships. So they are trying to address some yeah. of those issues. And in fact, it is worth pointing out that it's not entirely Google's fault. I mean, the universities themselves have to change the way they evaluate faculty, right. what it means to be in both industry, what it means to do scholarship. It's way in the weeds, uh, but there are important historical things that universities are going to have and to do different. Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, we all started to talk a little bit about some of this ethical perspective on AI and machine learning. And uh, 
how can we, as we get excited and enthusiastic about applying these tools and developing these uh, amazing intelligent systems, how can we try to avoid the dark side of some of these uh, and unintended consequences? I'm talking about things like uh, uh, you know, the bias algorithms, I'm talking about issues like, uh, you know, sort of people with, in low-skilled jobs losing their jobs and not being able to find new employment. Uh, I'm talking about things like uh, pricing algorithms that now have started to collude in complex environments. Uh, so how can we avoid some of these uh, ethical issues? And let me start with you, Joe. The dark side of AI, you know, I was yeah. thinking about this and um, every, every movie that you see about AI and robots has always turned out bad, almost every movie, right? <laughs> and so it's an important question. I, and I think there's two, two pieces of this that, that I'll address and, and I'm sure Charles and, and, and uh, Val will talk about the other pieces of it, but I was, I was actually on a plane to Dubai last week and so when you're on a plane for 16 hours, you get to watch some of the more interesting shows. I was watching one of the sh shows called The Good Place, and they had the, the trolley example. I don't know if you guys have heard of that. And fantastic show. <laughs> you like The Good Place, yeah? So the trolley example is, you know, you're, you're tasked, the trolley is going down the, the tracks, and if you, if you don't hit the switch, you're going you're gonna to basically um, kill some people, three people. But, if you, but then you're going if to, you, if you do hit the switch, you'll, you'll end up, yourself will die, right? And so the, it goes through all the different simulations. And it talks about what if it was a kid, and what if, what if it was a family, or the stroller. And, and, and you think about that, and then you, you, you apply that to autonomous vehicles, right? And, you, and autonomous vehicles are now becoming, you would know better than me, but much more likely to happen in the next few years. So autonomous vehicles then, if that same situation happens and the computer has to make that decision, who's making that decision, right? Is it the company making the decision? Is it the corporate, is it the uh, consumer? Is, or is it the regulatory body, right? Because mm -hmm. if it's the company, they may say, look, we're going to protect our occupants first and foremost, no matter what happens on the outside mm -hmm. of this car. Well, is that the right answer ethically? So that's sort of, sort of the moral side of AI. Those are the issues that all of us have to resolve as we continue down this uh, path within AI. The second piece, garbage in, garbage out. I use that all the time. I'm so glad you use it too. Um, garbage in, garbage out. So you think about the bias in data. And you're starting to see this become a big problem, public problem for companies, right? So publicly, Amazon most recently, it was, it was, they, they were using a machine learning algorithm to actually look at resumes. And they were looking at resumes to determine the likelihood that that person would be successful in the job that they were hiring for. Pretty straightforward. The problem was the data that they were using was based on historical data that had bias in it. The bias, you can probably guess, the bias was actually um, negatively affecting the candidates that were female because most of the, most of the people that had worked in these jobs were male. So the, 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 the data itself was actually not technically wrong, but what was wrong was the fact that they had always been biased towards hiring males for those roles. And as a result, the algorithms were more uh, positively rating male applicants. So Amazon shut that program down, but that's just one example of data bias. Microsoft Tay was another one. Uh, the, the, the Twitter example where Tay basically went out to Twitter and it learned how to communicate with Twitter. And what ended up happening is the humans actually fed it a bunch of vulgar language. So it wasn't actually the technology, the, the Twitter feeds that were the problem, but the humans, once they figured out what Tay was doing, the humans were the problem. And, and so I think that's what we have to continue to watch for as we, as we think about the, the ethical dilemma that we're going to start to, all of us, academic institutions, consumers, <laughs> corporate America, Every one of us is responsible for making sure that we, we, we focus on this. Yeah. Uh, just quick comments about the same issue. It's an important issue. Yeah, no, absolutely. Issue. I mean, AI is a very powerful technology, but uh, with that power comes great responsibility. Mm. Um, just one point I want to uh, correct there is that the algorithms themselves are not biased. It's the data. They, yeah, it's the data. They, they reflect our own societal biases, right? Yes. Like, I mean, uh, according to equal justice initiative, the average American um, faces a one in 20 chance of incarceration in their lifetime. But it varies significantly by, um, by race and gender, right? So for, it increases to Latinos um, to one in six, and to black, black men it's one in three, right? Mm. That's the data, it has right. nothing to do with, right. with the algorithm. The danger is if we simply 
use that historical data to train AI algorithms. They will simply replicate the same biases we've had. At much larger scale and a At lot scale. more efficiently, right? A lot more efficient. Yeah. So to that extent, um, Google took a very bold step to uh, come up with and actually announced publicly a set of AI principles. It was announced by uh, Sun, our CEO, Sundar Pichar, last year. Yeah. And it, it wasn't just PR, um, it's for real. Since the announcement, we've worked internally to build processes and review boards to actually implement those AI principles. So as a practitioner, I see this every day because whenever we have a new AI opportunity from sales, it goes through the process and I'll be honest if I tell you the, the, the process or the review boards have actually rejected a fair amount of um, AI opportunities that were deemed to violate uh, AI principles. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't end there. Google is very, very serious. In fact, one of those principles is um, not to replicate um, any kind of unfair practices in society and also to uphold the privacy of um, our users' data. Um, so, in terms of the AI principles, we've also rolled it out to our developers. It's now baked into their training, right? When you take any of the, the uh, popular ML courses as, an engineer, as a Google engineer, you are trained on the AI principles. Um, but it's a very important thing, and I think uh, going forward, we have to think clearly and carefully about the ethics um, around the use of AI. So, uh, so a panel isn't a panel unless we can have some disagreement. So allow me to disagree with my new best friend from Google. Uh, he said something very specific, uh, which uh, is technically incorrect, but more importantly, which is the best kind of incorrect, but more importantly, um, allows us to walk down a path that I, I think is important to think through. So the algorithms are biased by definition. There's a technical definition of bias. They're biased. But in particular, they're biased in that they're, they are biased towards replicating what they see. Okay. This is a very different, this is a specific thing, right? So they are biased. They're biased in being correct, right? They're biased in being short. They're, bi they're biased in all kinds of ways. We, we have technical definitions for this. And this is actually a part of the problem because what it means is the goal of the algorithm is to replicate what it sees. So uh, the case that you gave, the, the case of the examples that uh, you gave as well, are basically uh, the machine is trying to be more efficient in um, duplicating and replicating all of the things that we do incorrectly. And it's far more efficient than we are. But the language that we use is important. So when you say something like um, it doesn't have a bias, or you say something that's well, objective, which is what people normally say, which you did not say, um, it means that so, so we're on the same plan now. Uh, it, means, it means that it allows us to uh, shed all responsibility for the output mm -hmm. and to assume that it is correct. Allow me to tell you a brief, bless you, allow me to tell you a brief story. So I've done machine learning for a very long time. Um, one area that I've never put any of my own intellectual energy into is vision, that object recognition, face recognition. However, I've made a pretty significant contribution uh, to computer vision uh, back in the early uh, 1990s. Unbeknownst to me, my um, good friends and uh, grad student friends at MIT uh, had taken pictures that included me Nobody told me this, but that's fine. Um, and we're using it in order to train models in order to do face recognition. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that it was working perfectly well on everyone but me. For reasons that are clear <laughs> if you think about them after a little while. So the first thing they did is uh, they complained to me about it. <laughs> uh, <Is that> error? <laughs> please be different somehow. Uh, and uh, then they, they fixed the problem by... <laughs> They fixed the problem by lightening me oh. and uh, centering me in this. The pictures are terrible. Anyway, this, and so in fact, if you go back and you look at um, papers from the time period, you will see tons of pictures of me and I will be unrecognizable because it looks nothing like me. And that got them through you know, a few uh, review cycles. Eventually, they got around to the point of actually figuring out how to make that work and it really mattered. We have the same thing in all aspects of our lives. We know a lot about heart attacks in men. We do not do very well with heart attacks in women yes. because we have been training our doctors on men. We are training our algorithms on the wrong kind of data. And one thing that I think you, if you, if you learn nothing else from this, and I've heard this again and again from, from everyone on the panel, in, in, including the moderator, is it doesn't work unless you build it in from the very beginning. If you try to tack it on at the end, it simply 
does not work. You can get away with it by lightening, doing the moral equivalent of lightening somebody's skin, but it doesn't solve the underlying problem. And eventually, people go to jail uh, as a result of this because we predict that they will commit crimes again, but we're not actually predicting that they're committing crimes. What we're actually predicting is that they'll be arrested again which is not the same thing. We're predicting not only they'll be arrested, but that they'll be convicted. We're not just predicting they'll be convicted, we're predicting that they will then spend time in jail far longer than someone else who might have been convicted. And that just simply reflects the way the current system works, and in fact is a positive feedback loop that makes things worse. So in the end, the data is gonna drive everything, and remembering that although the algorithms are perhaps deterministic, they are not themselves without a kind of bias that allows us to um, efficiently integrate our own biases into the decision making. Well played. But I still like you, and I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we have about 10 more minutes. Let me stop here and invite the audience uh, for questions. Uh, yeah, you go first. Hi, I'm Dave there, is, there is a... Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't think. Hi, I'm Dana Vard. I'm a student uh, at Cheller. I'm graduating soon, and thank you guys for taking the time to come talk to us. Um, I have a two-part question. One has to do with what uh, our dean brought up. It's the ethical question. What really, um, what I think about that kind of scares me about uh, artificial intelligence is it's, it's a tool that accelerates almost everything. So in, in our world, we're seeing the gap between us in here, the privileged, and the ones that don't get to be in here increase every day, not, not just in the U.S., but when you compare the average person in the U.S. versus the rest of the world. So how do you guys think about AI being a tool that could potentially even worsen that, make that speed even faster? So that's the first part. The second part is you guys talk a lot about how you help your clients and the different businesses that contact you. Um, outside of the DOD, have you been able to apply the, the power of artificial intelligence to some more progressive uh, um, um, initiatives that uh, the public sector or even organizations such as the UN or uh, that are trying to make the, the, the people not like us, uh, you know, have a better life. And so, so why don't I take the first one, then you guys can justify your company's existence with that. <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> So, Thanks for so your help, Charles. <laughs> I'm about helping others. I'm a professor. Um, so the, I think the, the answer to the question about the digital divide is exactly the right question to ask. It's actually quite important. And the answer is absolutely yes. This will, just, this will, this will exacerbate inequity. I think the way you get around that, uh, insofar as you're able to get around it, I mean, the world we live in is the world we live in, uh, is you ask the question, what is it exactly people need to know? I believe, um, and I'm sort of religiously required to believe this, but I believe that it's not about the AI per se. It's not about the machine learning per se. It's about being able to think a certain way around computation. So we are a separate college of computing because it is a separate discipline. It is not science, it is not engineering, it is not math, it is not the humanities, it has pieces of those things. And what you're actually gathering in that is you're learning how to think a particular way. Think about data in a particular way, think about specifications in a particular way, and provide comfort with the automation that is coming. And so if we can teach people to think that way in terms of computing, the AI, the machine learning follows from it, and you close the gap because people are able to participate in the larger economy. I, am, I, I will simply uh, end with this on that, uh, that is the key question. One thing that I think you can be proud of as a, as a Yellow Jacket, a part of Georgia Tech, is that this institution has put its uh, money where its mouth is on this. Uh, we have an online Master's of Science in Computer Science, for example, and uh, it started five years ago. We had zero students. We now have 9,000 students. The cost of the entire degree is $6,600, as opposed to $46,000, which is what it would cost you to come on campus. Why is that important? Because, as has been pointed out, there's a gigantic gap in jobs and in training. And this program, by itself, is going to add 8 to 10% a year to the number of graduate students, not just in this country, but across the world, who are able to reach those jobs. It is a fundamental part of the mission of any public university to do that. And it should be uppermost in our minds, just as these questions of ethics, just as all the other things that were raised here today. So it's exactly the right question to ask. And if we are not careful, we will wake up 20 years from now, and it will already be too late to solve the, the, the gap that has been created. But people are trying to do it, and I think it's important that people like you ask those questions. Yeah, and I think the real opportunity is to use the power of computing, the scale that you can achieve, just like that example, at all levels. And frankly, it should start at the elementary school level. 
because by the time you kind of wait to get to a graduate level online degree, if you don't have the background, you're never going to be able to access that. Absolutely. So I think there are real opportunities to use the power of technology to really educate on a large scale basis at different levels. So. And very briefly, in the interest of time, um, Google really cares passionately about that. And that's a great question, by the way, both questions. The first one is yes, just like um, the internet. You know, when the internet happened, um, several people said, oh, it's a great equalizer. Mm -hmm. I remember my first reaction when I finished um, Friedman's book, The World is Flat Because yes. of the Internet, yes. was total disagreement because that wasn't true. Um, he, did mention George, he did mention Georgia Tech in that book, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so AI, just like we, we saw with um, the, digit, the internet, um, AI can, it has the potential to increase the digital divide. So one thing, though, um, Google is doing intentionally is to try and increase access. Um, and I'm very proud to say as an African um, that g last year, Google announced, and this year they just opened, the first ever AI lab uh, in Africa. Mm -hmm. So they opened this lab in, in Ghana. And it's not gimmicks, it's a real R&D facility led by a Google Brain researcher. Mm -hmm. And Jeff Dean, who leads our RMI, is actively involved. So that will give access to the next generation of uh, CS students and researchers throughout Africa to actually start using AI to solve local problems. Second thing is, uh, you mentioned uh, the UN, Google, partners very deeply with the UN Foundation to achieve the same thing, right? To try and solve some of humanity's biggest goals with this powerful AI technology. I was uh, privileged to be at um, the World Economic Forum in Davos in, Ju in January, where they announced the winners of a, a contest that Google ran as part of their Data for Good initiative. In the interest of you know, time, I'll, I'll close here, but I'll, I'm happy to uh, follow up with you to provide more details if you want. One last quick question. Mm, let me go all the way in the back there. Yeah, what is the small, or actually any of the three, what is the smallest organization? Thank you. Sorry. What is the smallest organization by size or market cap that you've seen successfully use AI or implement AI in that organization? Go ahead. <coughs> Um, <laughs> so we at Google, so professional services works intentionally with uh, enterprises, but Google at large works with all kinds of um, customers. The smallest I've seen is a small dairy farm. In fact, we had the, two of them are very similar. One is a dairy farm in Japan. There's another one in, um, in the Netherlands who are using AI technology to improve the way they manage their, their cattle stock. Mm -hmm. That's as small as I've seen. I've read about a case, but I, I'm not familiar with it, of a um, Korean um, dry cleaning shop that basically used AI to effectively sort um, their laundry every day. So frankly, this technology uh, is not only for large enterprises. Um, it can be very, very powerful, just like with the internet. It can be very, very powerful, even for a small um, startup. Yeah, agriculture was where I was going to go too, which is drone drones and drone technology is that's actually something you can use today on a farm a local farm right you can have drones actually fly around and use visual recognition uh, to, to determine if there's areas of your crops that are damaged or need you know water or fertilizer etc and so we're seeing a lot of um, progress in the agriculture space that I think is going to have nice, a nice impact on society as well all the examples I know of are in agriculture as well huh? all right. the examples I personally know of are in agriculture yeah agriculture well. I think yeah. that's good so in the interest of time, it's about 6 o'clock. Um, many thanks to our panelists. Let's give them a great hand. Thank you all for being here tonight. I hope you uh, are all going away with some new insight into this very important topic. Uh, I also like to thank my team for putting this uh, session together for the great job that they have done. Uh, and this concludes tonight's program. Please join us for a reception in the atrium. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Nice job. Well, of course, I enjoyed it. I appreciate that. <laughs> I should tell you something about Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, oh, yes.